All right. This is tricky. Okay, now it works. Great. Welcome back. Very happy to see so many people coming back. Uh, I think it's now the more interesting part. So the first part was just about organizational stuff, the lecture, and now the second part will be about our first steps in C++. And I want to take you on a like a journey from C to C++ in the next, yeah, let's say half an hour approximately, and then Michi and Julia will discuss also some parts of uh, C++, some introductory parts, um, meaning that next week we will come to the object-oriented part, we start with classes and so on. But this lecture now is all about uh, yeah, moving from C, what you hopefully know, to C++. Great, then let's start. The most obvious thing is the file name. We hopefully all know the main C file or whatever name you want to give your file. And in C++, it's just CPP. I think we can uh, remember this. The second thing is the compiler. I hope all of you know Clang or CLang. Um, and it is pretty much similar. It is then Clang++. So when you want to compile your code, just use Clang++ for C++. Another difference is we always worked with the standard AO library and at C++ it's a little bit different. We now use the IO stream library. We will come to streams, um, I think in your part then in the practicals, we will talk about streams in general, but from now on we use the IO stream library and what you might have spotted is we do not need this dot h in the end, just IO stream. Another new thing is printf is most likely one of the most used functions, especially in the beginning. Uh, debugging with printf is a common thing for beginners. And in C++, of course, you could use printf because everything you in C works, works also in C++. But we will use std c out. Looks a bit strange, I know. We, we will discuss what this std means here, what this two bubble points mean there. Um, it is not that hard to understand, we will come to that. But from now on, when you see this kind of code, we refer to printf. And another thing is scanf to read something something from the terminal or from the user. From now on, we will use this stdc in, and this is just for input. These are the, yeah, of course, not all the changes, but the changes we will use from now on. Um, and I think most of them are quite clear, so just use another file extension, just use another compiler, and for printf and for scanf, we have own functions which make life easier for us. All right, then I want to write my first Hello World program, and it is like this. It is just, we include our library, and then we have again a main function like in C, we have a return value, but as you can see, we have this stdc out here and we have this operators here, which are the stream operators. Then we have our text and some another std end line. What does this here in the end mean is um, 
like a new line. So it just prints a new line. Um, I will give you a short example and how this works. So I hope you can see this also from the back. Great, thank you for the response. So when we compile this, like using Clang++, minus V all, minus O for the main, this is then our output name. So it is pretty similar like we had in C. And then our program name, our file name, which is main CPP, it works, okay, and then we call the program, and as you can see, the output is hello world. So very basic, when we remove this std end line, it's save, compile again, you can see, okay, that's a little bit of a display issue, but there shouldn't be a new line at the end. I don't know why this is printed. Um, do you have an idea why this is the case? I, it, because I just configured the terminal that always the prompt is in the next line, but this, ah, okay. the percent just uh, tells that there is no new line character. Yeah. So of course it would also work with printf, but as you might see, um, it is a little bit different than printf. We do not need this format specifier anymore. So we had before, when we wrote printf, we had to write this percent %d, or here, percent %d, and then, I don't know, 4, for example, or whatever variable we want to use. And with this stdc out, we don't need it because we can write variables directly inside here. Of course, when we say, okay, int x is 5, we can say, instead of the hello world, five and when we compile and execute then it's five there was a question no okay so this is quite convenient because we can use now uh, variables directly here in the stream i think you will talk about streams later on a little bit more um, but what you can see here is basically we are taking this variable and we hand it over or we write it into the output stream. So this two, um, two uh, operators here, how are they called in C++? output operator, I don't know, yeah, streaming operator. They just indicate we take the, the value of x and stream it into the output. And of course, as we have uh, seen before, there's a counterpart. We can say, for example, we have a variable and then we say c in and we can write. Now, this is the other way around here we can write something in this variable and print it out again. So when we compile this, there is of course an error, but I want to have a look on the error message. Okay, this is quite clear. It says, did you mean as it is in with this two double points? Just fix this error. Compile again. And now I can give an input. Okay, this five is printed in before, but I can give an input. And then you can see there is the output. Would be more nice if I make an end line, end line in the end and remove this here because it looks odd. We give three and then the output is also free. So this is the counterpart to scanf. Um, you can use this c in and the c out is uh, for printing. Yes? Um, 
you know the the exact difference? I know I know what's the difference in general. Uh, if you're using uh, STT end line, then this also flushes the output. So um, if you're just using backslash n, the output gets not flushed. Uh, this means, for example, if you just print backslash n and then uh, your program crashes, it's not necessarily the case that the output is really printed to the terminal. However, you, if you use STT end line, then the output gets really printed to the terminal. And if then your program crashes, it was printed before, so you see it. Thank you. Just want to test you. <laughs> All right, another thing what we already used are so-called namespaces. And namespaces are there to organize your code. So you, have, you will have a lot of functions, and a lot of variables, and you can define, let's say, the scope or the, the space where they are valid. And this is a cool thing about uh, namespaces. So let's create a struct. And I hope most of you are familiar with structs um, or at least remember them. Um, so we have a struct here, a superhero, which has a name, a power, and a strength. And then the first observation is we do not need this type def here anymore. In C, we had to write type def struct superhero and then writing the superhero here once again. It's not needed in C++ anymore. So you can define structs just like that. The other thing is, let's suppose we want to create another struct and want to name it um, in the same way, so it's again a superhero, but we have slightly different members. We have a name, power, and the weakness. And when we do this, we get, of course, an error because it says it's a redefinition of the struct superhero, so this does not work. How can we solve these problems? And this is where namespaces helps us a lot. We can say, for example, we create two namespaces, a Marvel uh, namespace and a DC namespace, each having their own superheroes with their own members. And when we compile this, this also works. So um, yeah, we can have the exact same variable in two different namespaces. And how to access a namespace we use this operator here. So as you can see, we access the namespace Marvel and access the superhero struct. And then we just define a variable of this object here. So we have also seen before when we, when we talked about STD C out or STD C in, there was also this double double point here. Um, so this just says we entering a namespace. So in this case, namespaces provide a way to yeah, organize and encapsulate your code elements and divide it um, logically into, into separate, um, yeah, separate structs in this case. But sometimes namespaces can be annoying because you have to write them all the time, of course. And let's say we have an example like this. We have a company namespace and inside there's an apartment namespace and inside there's a team namespace and there is an ID, I don't know. And we want to just access this ID. We have to go through all the namespaces to get this variable. And this can be annoying, of course. So there are uh, solutions for that problem. And you could write, you could write using before. So again, we have our superheroes here. But when you write using namespace Marvel, the program assumes that you always be in this namespace of Marvel. So you have to write DC superhero to go into this namespace, but you do not have to write Marvel here again because it always assumes 
to be in this uh, namespace. And that's quite helpful because in many times you will be in one file into the same namespace and this helps a lot, especially, yeah, it reduces the amount of time you have to write unnecessary namespace declarations to come to a variable. Yes? Interesting question. I don't know what happens then, but you can try it out. Uh, I can't copy it here. Um, I think it will just take one of them. It will be arbitrary. I don't think there is there is a specification for that. So in my opinion, I think it will be just taken one of them, but you don't know which one of them. So you should avoid this, of course, yeah. And of course, you should avoid having a list of usings in the beginning of your file because this is what the this was uh, this it was what the problem occurs then because namespaces are made to save you from these uh, problems and if you write using namespace and list there ten things that's exactly um, yeah the thing namespaces should should help you and you just go around this help. So I wouldn't do that. Yes? Uh, no. So the question is, can, can I write, for example, also here the um, a, a using statement. Using state, write using statements always on top of your file and they are taken from the whole file. So uh, you cannot start with the using somewhere in between. Just please put them always on top. And it's also better for visibility uh, because you will get lost then when you have a using somewhere in between the functions. That's that's not good practice. David, can I interrupt you for a moment? Um, I checked the uh, using uh, the double using yeah. um, directive, and it doesn't work. So it takes both into account, and then it says uh, the reference to the super is ambiguous. It's ambiguous. Okay. So it takes both of them into account. So if you if you want to use uh, both of them, and you call the you have different names for the structs, it will just work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there was another question. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You you can you can define it wherever you want. Um, always on top, um, because then you can use it down below, um, and you can also use it in the main function. Yeah. But as I said, please use it with caution. So do not write 10 using statements because it is exactly what you should not do. That's why you have namespaces because it might be a conflict between the namespaces. And what you should also not do is, um, we had this before, we had this std c out, we had the hello world. And as you can see now, this std namespace um, so this C out function and this end line function are just inside of this STD uh, standard library in this namespace. And you could do, for example, using namespace STD. Somebody, or I have seen students doing this, but this will lead to troubles because there are, um, there is ambiguity inside. So you will have problems with that. So please don't just use the whole namespace. There are um, solutions if you, of course, do not want to write always this STDC out. What you could do is just write using STD 
C out, and then you can just write C out without the STD and the namespace before. So this means, okay, I'm just using the C out function of this STD library, and I do not want to declare it all the time. Um, so this is okay, you can do this if you want to write um, C out, for example, many times. I would recommend it, but please do not just write using namespace STD because the whole C++ standard library is then, um, yeah, you, you take the whole C++ standard library as your namespace and this shouldn't or this might lead to problems. Great, that was the part from namespace. Now we come to auto. Uh, the problem is it's not like auto what you could expect. Um, it's not a car, but auto is just a keyword in C++ and a keyword which make life easier for us, in my opinion. Think of this very, very easy line of code. We have an integer x and we assign five. And what auto does is it just decides the data type for you. So you can write now in C++, for example, y is equal to x and you say auto. So compiler, please decide for me which data type this should be. You could also say auto message hello or auto p the number. So this is quite convenient. Um, and I have a small programming part here. So let's say we have this int x with five and then we have this auto y with four and then I want to print the size of y. Always missing this. What do you think will be the output? There's a warning for unused variable. Okay, we can neglect it. But what do you think is the output here? Any ideas? So you want to know the size of auto. Eight, okay. Other, other ideas? Four, yeah, why four? Because it's just an integer and the compiler is intelligent and he knows, okay, this might be four and it is four, yes. So this works, great. So the compiler decides, okay, we write four into a variable, it is most likely an integer, so we define it as an integer. What happens if I say auto my message and I say hello? Then I just move it to here and say size of the message. Any ideas? Eight, okay. Four, okay. It is eight. Why is it eight? It's a size of a point in this case, exactly. So it should be the same when I say like this. Yeah, but in 64 bit systems, we have eight bytes for that, and it is still eight, yeah. So it doesn't depend on the length of the string, it's just a pointer to the string, and the string is stored somewhere else. Great, so this is very cool, having this auto. Why not just always write auto? Because I don't need to define uh, what data type it is, why the compiler does it for me. And auto is very useful and it can be very, very helpful for advanced and long um, names. And we will come to that specially when we come to iterators 
iterators are a concept where you write, yeah, let's say the data type is, I don't know, 20 characters long. And this can be very, very annoying. So then auto is great help. But it can be sometimes problematic. For example, let's say you are more intel or hopefully you're more intelligent like the compiler. You create an ID for your company and you have one million members in your company. And the first person has the ID one, the second this ID two and so on. And you create this variable with auto. You have just four bytes of, of uh, memory for that. So if when you reach the one million person and you cre want to create a member ID for them, you will not have a unique ID because it's an overflow. So when you know you have a variable which is not or which will be not uh, four bytes long, please use the data type. Uh, you know you should, or it should be the other way around. If you know if it's only 255 um, is your highest number you want to represent, just re use a character because it is smaller than the four byte from the integer. And the other thing is, the code might be harder to read and it might be harder to follow your ideas uh, and you will work in a group and especially when you're doing a group work and the other group members cannot really follow what you are doing or what you plan to do but this is an error for example um, it might help that you write the data type there because you deliberately say, I want this variable to be this data type. And with auto, you do not have really control of it. Yeah, I, I, will, I get a sign that I have to hurry up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but there are 10 slides left for my side. So I will, I will, I will manage it. We'll come to another very, very interesting topic which will make life so much easier for you, which are range-based loops. And I know you often had this problem. You have an array of, let's say, I don't know, five integers, and you have to write four int i is equal to one. i, uh, as long as i is less than five, i plus plus, and it's so annoying to writing all this kind of things for just printing out the array. This is so much to write and it's often, it's always the same thing. Um, my experience, most of the time you want to iterate over the whole array. So there is an advantage in C++ called range-based loop. And what you can do is actually write for then int i, so this is then my iterator in this case. And we iterate over the whole array. And then in this i variable here, you will get at first the first number, then the second number, then the third number and so on. So you do not need to write here again array at the index i. So because this i value here is already the value you have uh, in the array. And this is very, very convenient. And you will make use of this, I don't know, 90% of the time, because most of the time you are iterating over the whole array. All right. One last, I think, very, very important topic are references in, in C++. And this is also a huge advantage. Uh, in comparison to C. Let's have, again, a short recap of classic pointers in C. I hope all of you have an idea what happens here. We created an integer x and write 10 into it. Then we take the address of this uh, variable and write it into a pointer. So in this 
PTR variable here is the address of the, of the number 10 of the variable. And then we have to dereference the pointer to come to the value. I hope this is clear um, and familiar, but there is a problem here. And this is in general a problem with programmers. We are quite lazy and we want to write less code. We want to write it easier and the references helps us a lot in this case. So what we can do is um, we create a reference. So this is like our own data type. We create a reference and we take the address of this exactly using this reference here. And the advantage is that we do not need to dereference it. So we do not need this asterisk here to dereference the value. Uh, this is just like an alias for this variable. So we have two variables now pointing to the same value. It is similar to pointers, but it is less work uh, because we do not need to dereference it here. I give you another example. This is again classic pointer and uh, similar as before, we want to increment this value here and it is very annoying. We have to put this parenthesis. We had to uh, write this asterisk before and then we can in in increment it and then we can give it out or or when we want to use the pointer here, again, we should use the asterisk. But this is so much to write, and on the keyboard, it's just annoying to write. And with references, it's much easier, because when we define again the reference, we can just say ref++, plus plus, which does completely the same, and we can put it out or, or work with it in whatever way we want. So this is very, very convenient using references. Another advantage, yes? Uh, the references are still a pointer and not a, a new value, right? The reference is not really a pointer, so it is not, it is, it is not really an own variable, so it does not consume uh, bytes. It is just an alias for the existing variable, yeah. Yes. In this case, how would I go about incrementing x equals 10 then? Oh no, the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great, so another advantage is using references is at function parameters. Um, when you have functions like this, we have this call by value concept where we just hand over the value here and we want to increment it and what is the output of this code here? It's 10, great. It is because it's just by value. The value here is copied. This is another value to, to this variable here. So nothing happens here. The cool thing uh, in C was that we can use pointers to solve this problem. So we hand over the address. We take the address here as pointer, dereference it, increment it, and the output then will be 11, so it works what we wanted. But again, it is hard to write and a little bit hard to read. And this is again the same thing here, call by reference using pointers. And with references, the cool thing is we could just take here or, or pass over the x, variable and we could write it the same here, but we just take a reference to this existing variable. So you can think of this like we passing this variable x and here we just take the address of x, like the address of x, and it works similar like here, but we do not need to write the asterisk here or the parentheses here. Uh, we just can write number plus plus and it works it as, as it is with pointers. So call by reference with 
real references in C++ is very, very convenient and you should use references whenever possible um, because it is one thing what we discussed before which might save you a lot of computational time because when you have huge arrays and they are called vectors, but I think we will come to that soon, and you hand this over into a function, this will be copied and it might be a problem, uh, but if you take the reference, this uh, problem is solved because it's not copied and the same value is used then, or the same vector in this case. All right, so to conclude here on references, use this address of operator instead of the asterisk. Uh, references are like an alias or a reference to an existing variable. They are not really like pointers, which is just another variable. It is just an alias for an existing uh, variable. Um, and one thing is that, um, yeah, re re references cannot be null or null pointer, which is the counter, the C++ counterpart of, of null. And references cannot be uninitialized. So when you try to create a reference and give nothing inside, so do not initialize it, there will be a compiler error because references always have to be initialized. Yes. Uh, not really, because references do not have a location, so they do not take memory in the binary in the end. This is just another, very not really a variable, but a, a reference to an existing, but it has no, uh, let's say, 8-byte or whatever. It does not consume memory. All right, any other questions to references? Yes? Yeah, sure. Um, there are, of course, many possibilities to use references. You can try it, of course. It's so easy uh, to use references. Of course, you can have a reference to a pointer. A pointer is just an address, so you have a reference to an address. Any other questions to references? If not, I think you will... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Continue with your C features. Okay. Um, let's start with something. Um, fun in C++, which I think is very cool. Um, function overloading. So let's first talk about function signatures. Um, I think as we all know from C, um, what identifies a function. Uh, in C, a function is identified just by its name. So um, you give a function a name and when you use that name, you always just refer to that function. In C++, this is a bit different, that a function signature also consists of the parameter types. Uh, so a function with different types in its parameters is a different function, even if it has the same name than another function. So what is the consequence of this? Um, if we define this function f, and then at one point, we just have an int parameter, then at another two ints, and then maybe a double or something. Um, if we call f um, based on which types we pass to this function, the correct one is chosen. And this is also important. The return type of a function is not part of the signature. So um, if two functions have the same arguments and the same name, but different return types, this is just an error because for the compiler, this is the same function. Um, 
Okay, so let's look at this code snippet. I have the same three functions as before. The first one prints int, the second one int, int, and the third one double. So what do you think um, is printed here? Yes? Yes. So I think you can run it. Yeah. We see first table is printed, then int, and then to int. Because if we pass a, a double here to the function, the compiler knows that it should take this one. And this one is executed. And the same is here and here. So um, this one takes the function with, uh, which has just an int, and this which takes two integers. Uh, next part that we want to talk about is also something about functions. Uh, we want to talk about default parameters of a function. Um, so think about this code uh, segment here. So we want to create a fraction, as a Bruch in Deutsch, and the fraction has a numerator and a denominator. And now, if the denominator would be trivial, so it would be just one, I don't want to specify it when I call the function. So uh, if I, for example, just want to have three and represent it uh, as a fraction, uh, then I want to omit the one here in the denominator. And um, so I just want to pass one argument to the function instead of two. In C, this was not possible, but now in C++, it is possible to do that. And we can simply specify here uh, in the corresponding arguments a default value, which would be one in our case. Um, so the function call of fraction in the first case would be numerator is three, denominator is one. And of course, we can call the function with two arguments, with an enumerator and a denominator. And in this case, of course, the denominator would be four because we uh, really um, pass the parameter there. And if we omit the parameter, then the default value is taken. Of course, there are some restrictions here now uh, because uh, if we would, for example, give the numerator a default value, um, then, um, and the denominator would not receive a default value. So if we do something like this, um, then it wouldn't be clear what this first part means. Does this now set the numerator to three or is it just the denominator and the numerator should take the argument two? So this is unclear for it, for this, uh, for this, uh, for that reason, really, um, all the um, parameters that have a default value need to be specified at the end of the function. Um, so just to put it together, the default parameters must be at the end, and the default value is used if no other value is specified. And if I just go back um, to the previous page, of course the position uh, in the function call specifies to which parameter um, the value corresponds to. Yeah? Uh, what if I have uh, two variables at the end with um, uh, initial value, mm -hmm. and I want to fill the third one with the value? Do I have to say so you, now and then the value? Or so if you, for example, uh, have default parameters, for example, for all values, so let's put it this way, we have the numerator equals zero, and now you want to modify the denominator. That was for a question. So, for example, it should have zero two. Uh, no, if man, there is a mandatory part, and then I have uh, this optional part, mm -hmm. and I don't want uh, to fill the first optional variable. Okay. Um, of course, if you have multiple optional variables, as as here, then you have to fill out all the optional values until the last one that you don't want to have the the default value. So in, in this case, if you want to set the denominator to two and the numerator to zero, you still have to call uh, zero and two because otherwise it wouldn't be clear to the compiler what happens. Yeah? Uh, so if you specify a type here, like an integer, then this needs to have a certain value. Um, there are concepts where you can also have uh, like an 
optional variable that can have a value or not, but we do not discuss this yet. Okay, then continue. I just, I just want to trigger you. Why, why didn't you use the denominator uh, default value to zero? I'm studying math, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's continue with something already teased by David, um, a vector. But first I want to talk about what annoyed you with C arrays. <laughs> Now it's your, uh, your turn, come on. What annoys you? Yes. The size is really hard to get. Mm -hmm. No size information, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's always the same size, that's also a problem. Anything else? Yeah. No mm -hmm. Yeah, that could also annoy you. Anything else? Okay, I can't help with the different data types, but there are many things um, C++ with vectors does improve over C arrays. For example, they cannot change their size. Um, there's no bounds checking when you access an array, so if you're out of bounds, just anything could happen. Um, and dynamic memory when you want arrays that can change size um, is much effort. And there's no length information. So if you want to know how long an array is, you also always need to pass a second parameter to a function, for example. Um, and also there's no copy mechanism, so you need to call a separate function to copy um, an array to another array, or loop over them or something. And now we have the vector. We need to include it, so up here we have include vector, and then we can use it. It's in the standard namespace, so we write standard colon colon vector, and then in these angle brackets here, um, we need to write the type um, that we want in this array. For example, if you want, or in this vector. For example, if you want a vector with the type integer, we write int here. And then, um, as in C, we can just specify with an initializer list here um, what we want in this vector. Yes? Um, I don't <laughs> know about that, but I think you can omit it and then it automatically infers the integer type. But, but if you would write auto, uh, so you mean auto in the integer part, right? Okay, like here. yeah. Auto is not permitted in the template Yeah, so it wouldn't work. And you but can, you can omit it. And you can also, of course, not substitute the whole std vector integer with auto mm -hmm. because then it would be just a C array. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, we didn't have any size information in C, and in C++ we now have this size method we can call on this vector um, to get uh, the length of the vector. So if I run this, <laughs> it doesn't want to. <laughs> I could just check whether this is running still. But I think maybe your compiler doesn't want to. Okay, it doesn't want to. But I, I'm now the compiler and the output, and the output would be three in this case. Oh, it works. Okay, it works again. <laughs> okay, so we see the length is three. Um, what we also can do now is just append an element with the pushback method for example, for um, to this vector, and we don't need to think about memory or resizing this array. This just works now. So what does this pushback do exactly? Yeah, it depends this element, the for, at the end of the vector. Um, now, let's get to copying a vector. So if we just create a second int integer vector, so I called it v2, and then assign v to v2, um, the whole array or vector is copied to v2. So now we have a second vector, v2, which has 
um, the same content, but it's a new vector which is really copied. Um, we can see that if we append another element to the V vector and then compare the sizes of both. And if we run this now, how do I scroll? Okay. Um, we see that the V2 vector still has four elements and the original V vector has five because we appended one element here and this assignment copied the whole vector. Um, and of course, as we saw with references, this now is the prime example why you should use references when calling a function, because calling a function is always called by value, so we copy the whole vector if we pass it, therefore um, we use a reference. And you can see that here, for example, I have this print vector function, and I pass um, now a constant reference to this function. Uh, I created the vector here, the same as before, and then I just um, pass it to this function, and because here we specified that it's a reference, um, uh, it, it doesn't get copied, it just um, uses this reference in this function. I have a question mm -hmm. now. Why are you using cons there and not just uh, reference as we've seen before? Okay, so this is just to specify that we don't want to modify the vector and this is good practice. Uh, yeah. So I, think, I think we will discuss cons uh, next time or in two weeks. Um, there are so many yeah. possibilities to use cons, uh, but in this case, yeah, as you said, it's just defined that this function do not change the vector. And it's just good practice to um, specify that when you don't intend to modify it. Yes? Why do you want to pass it as a reference if you don't plan to change it in the function? Yeah, that's because we, I don't want to copy it. If I have a really huge vector, maybe that's gigabytes in size, I don't want to copy to a function just to um, print it, which maybe doesn't make sense with such a big vector, but if I want to do something with it in a function, I don't want to copy it there. And if I use a reference, um, I can just reference this vector, like I would use a pointer so I don't have to copy it when I call a function. Yeah, and the answer is also listed in the function name. So you just want to print it, for example. We don't want to change when we print. Um, yeah, so what about bounds checking? I also listed that in the first slide that with C arrays, um, if I access it out of bounds, anything could happen. So let's try it here with this vector. Oh, and we see it just works. But that's but, index free. Yeah, but it's index free, so this doesn't exist. We have zero index zero, index one, index two, and index three is somewhere outside of the vector and we just accessed it. But you, we don't want to do that. And that's why we don't use this operator to index into a vector um, in C++. Instead, we use the add function, as you can see here, to access index three. And this add function always checks the index we want to access, is this really inside of our vector? And if not, it more or less crashes the program. We'll get to that later in the lectures. But if you run this now, we can see, okay, we get some error um, out of range. So now we can directly um, spot what went wrong. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Uh, sorry. But um, <laughs> why is it better to crash the program instead of having an access to an invalid memory address? Yeah. Maybe many of you already realized that in ESP, but if you do something with memory that you're not supposed to, like accessing an array out of bounds, maybe even writing something there, then this can lead to all sorts of problems because you're overwriting memory and you don't know what's there. It could even be that um, there is another variable and you just overwrote that. And now basically anything could happen in your program. 
Um, yeah. Uh, which one? Oh, okay. The zero here is just because, um, coincidentally, there was a zero byte directly after this vector. So we just read a memory location which we didn't initialize or which we don't use. So here could be anything depending on, um, yeah, I guess your operating system and all kinds of factors. Um, yeah. And the cool thing is this add method, because it returns a reference, can also be used in assignments. So we can say um, the vector at position zero um, equals four. And when we run that and print position zero up here and then down here, we can see this change the value at position zero for this vector. Um, and there are many, many more methods which you can do with vectors. For example, removing um, items or adding to the front. And there are really, really many things you can do. And you can read about that at those links. Um, of course, they, all, they will also be in the handouts. You can find on Notion afterwards. So on our course website. Are there any further questions regarding vectors in C++? Otherwise, we continue. Was there one? Yeah. Mm, yeah. You will get to that later in the course. Okay. Um, then, next thing that we want to talk about are strings in C++. Um, when we think back, about introduction to programming in C. We had those strings, we had, we said that there were just character arrays, we had this null terminating byte at the end and many things to consider. And now let's have a look what uh, C++ offers here. Um, so basically C++ offers now a wrapper around the C string, which behaves similar to a, a vector in, in the case of arrays. And uh, strings in C++ can be of dynamic size again, so we can increase the string or decrease the size of a string. Um, the memory management is done by this STD string, so we don't have to deal with that in C++, uh, which makes it much easier. And same as for the vector, also there are a lot of operations already predefined that we can use. So this really makes our life as a programmer easier. So let's see how we can create a string. Um, so we just write the data type std string, so also standard library. So we shouldn't also not forget to include the string. And then we can just uh, assign some string to it. Um, of course, we can also create empty strings if we do not assign any value to them. And we can copy strings by assigning an existing string to them. And yeah, let's see what the output of this very short program is. Uh, so the copy string uh, is a copy of my string and my string was just hello op1, so this worked. And the empty string is just this empty line at the very bottom because there was no output. Um, maybe we want to think a little bit about where the C string is. Um, we can access the C string, which is behind this std string, which C++ offers, with a method called dot data or dot C string. And then we would really get a, a pointer to the underlying C string. And this C string has also all the um, requirements that the C string fulfills with the null terminating byte and so on. Are standard strings null terminated? Standard strings are null terminated, yes. So the um, the, the standard string has some pointer to the string, which is most likely on the heap, and this uh, string there is a C string, which is now terminated. Uh, I 
read through this today and since C++11 it's the same function basically. So before there was really a difference, so uh, before the data function uh, it was not required that it's really a null terminating string, but now for the C++ versions that we use, it's the same. Uh, we already mentioned this, it's pointing on the heap, and now the important thing is, please don't use it. Or use it only in the case if it's really necessary to use it, but if you avoid it, then nothing bad can happen. Because if, assume you would change this C string manually, then this std string from C++ doesn't know that there are any changes, so it would then correspond to a modified string which uh, it, is, it doesn't store the length information of it, and so on and so forth. So just don't use that. I just want to present it to you that you see there is a C string behind, but don't use it unless you really need to use it, and then don't modify the C string. Yeah. I just mean this, uh, I just meant this particular pointer, not pointers at all. Um, how can we access elements? Now this is a very easy slide to you because you already know that from Julia before. It's the same as for a vector. Please use the, the add uh, function here and specify the index because there you have the bound check. If you use the um, brackets, then you don't have the bounce check and the same bad things can happen. So please just avoid them, use the add function here. Um, then there is also the same possibility to access the, or to, to get the length of a string as in a vector where we call it with dot size. And strings are usually associated with a length, so you have also this length function and size and length do completely the same for standard strings. They are just uh, aliases. And we can also try this here. I have this example where we have this hello op1 string. We print once the size and once the length. And let's see whether it's true what I said. Okay, in both cases it's 14. So they, those two functions are really the same. You can just use one of them. Now we want to do a bit more with strings. Um, when we think back about C, we have two C strings and we compare them with this equal equal operator. What did we really compare? We just compared the pointers, whether the pointers are the same. But not what's behind the pointers, what's the content of the C strings. So the equals equals operator for strings did not work in C. But now, for C++, very luckily, it really works. So we can really compare two strings with this equal equal operator. I also have an example here. So we have one string and another string. Both have yeah, the same content. And now we compare them. And let's see what's the output. OK, the strings are equal. So this comparison operator really works. In C, um, those strings would be the same, but the pointers would be different, and then it wouldn't work. Um, then there are more operations on strings, um, so we can also have this plus operator, so with string A plus string B, we can concatenate those two strings to get a string which consists of both parts. And we can also use this plus equals operator with strings, which just appends the string P, uh, the string B to the string A. Uh, also, there I have an example. Um, so we again have my string, which is hello. Then I use this plus equals operator with the missing part of OOP1. Then I print it. So this would be just hello OOP1. And then I take my string, hello op1, and uh, concatenate it with the emoji, and then we'll get uh, this whole output printed to stdc out. You could also verify that, whether this is true. So here in the first case, we got it without the emoji, and then we got it with the emoji. So this concatenating with the plus operator really works. Um, String manipulations, we can do much more things with strings. Um, so appending to a string, we already saw one option now with this plus equals operator, but there are more options. For example, the option Julia presented before, we have this pushback option. So we uh, call pushback on a string and uh, fill in one character. 
and this it, uh, appends a character to the end. Unfortunately, it's only possible to append characters this way. Um, so we have another, uh, uh, another possibility there. Uh, we have also an append method. And this append method now takes either a character or a string and appends that character or the string to the end uh, of the string. My question is now, why can there be two functions which have the same name? Was that possible in C++? Yeah. Yeah, it is possible because what was the signature of a function? So um, it consists of the name and the types um, of the arguments. So these are two different functions if, it, if one takes a character and the other one takes a string. So this is really convenient in this case. So we really use the concepts that we introduced first. Um, okay, so I have also here an example. So I have the string uh, hello, then I push back uh, a character, which is just this empty space, and then I append a string to it, and now I should again get hello op1, and this also works. So I, I can uh, push back and append elements to a string. So. Now I think I have a more advanced thing um, as the last part for the strings, um, but it's really useful. So there is a method called find, and in this find method, I specify some substring of the string that I'm looking currently at. So for example, I have hello op1, and then I'm searching for a certain substring, for example, for hello, but it could be also just a single character, an empty space, or op1, whatever. And then the find method checks, okay, is there a substring of that type contained in my string? If this is the case, then the first occurrence of the substring is returned, and what is returned exactly? The position where the substring starts. So if we have hello op1 and I would search for an e, then this would be position 0, 1 because the second character is an e there. Um, if we do not find an occurrence in that string, then this a bit weird looking SDA string npos is returned, uh, which just is a synonym for a minus 1. And why is that? So if we think about the length of a string, then yeah, strings can be really large, but also not exceed the, uh, the size of the memory. If we consider minus one as an unsigned integer or an unsigned long, then this would correspond to the largest possi possible value an integer or a long can take. So this n pos is really a, such a large value that it can never be reached um, within an ordinary string, so it's really uh, a way to, to tell you that, this, uh, that it's not a valid position in the string and thus the substring is not contained in the string. What can we do with that information? We can also use now a substring method where we specify the start and the length and then uh, we get a copy um, of our string starting at a certain position and ending after length many characters. So we get really a new string. So if we have a, a large string now, uh, for example, an input of the user, then we could, for example, find uh, spaces and then take substrings of everything which is before until the space and then starting from the space to the next space. So this is a way to split the user input, for example. I think I also have an example here. Yes, so I have now my string, which is hello op1, and I find now uh, the space. So I get the position of the space, which, which would be here, so it's position six, I think, zero, one, two, three, four, or five position five, and then I take a substring from zero to this position. So this would be then the hello part, and I take a substring starting at position plus one. So this was position, uh, this was position, so I'm starting at the O of OP1 and take the remaining part. So in this case, I omitted here the length argument, so the default length would be everything. 
Let's run this again and we get hello and op1. And last thing, we already discussed this with vectors and also David mentioned it before. Uh, if we pass a string to a function, again, if we just do it this way, it's called by value, so it gets copied. If the string is large, this would be uh, unnecessary to copy it. So we can use the reference. And in particular, if we do not want to modify the string within the function, we use this const part in the front. Yeah. And also here we have the references to the, uh, to the CPP reference in C++.com because also the string class offers much more opportunities that we cannot talk about all in the lecture here. Are there any questions regarding strings? Yeah? Yeah, so I have a question regarding the um, append method. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there like anything different to just adding it with a plus sign? Or? So append and plus equals is the same. Okay. Um, so there's like no uh, situation in which it would favor one over the other? No, it's just depends how you want to write it in this case. So it's synonym synonymous uh, as the, the size and the length. So this is uh, the same here. Any further questions? Okay, if that is not the case, uh, we have one last topic, but we will shift that to next Thursday at four. And this concludes now what we've seen today. So we started with the namespaces, range-based loops and references. And then we also had a look at the functions and uh, discussed the standard vector and the SSD string. Uh, do, you, do you have a, a small homework left? No, we've, no we okay. didn't come that far. Oh, okay, great. So thank you for being here. Um, hopefully see you next week. Hopefully it was interesting for you. Uh, we will dive into C++ and classes next week. Uh, thank you again and have a nice evening. Bye.